I'm Carrie DeWitt. I'm the Director of Community Engagement for the Boston Public Market Association. And I am just going to uh, give all the participants a few notes here. The first is that everyone is muted when they join the call. And we ask that you remain muted uh, to ensure that everybody can clearly hear our panelists. Um, if you're having any issues with connectivity, uh, sometimes in a big Zoom like that, that, this, that happens, feel free to turn off your video. Uh, that often helps with connectivity issues. We will be starting out tonight by asking our panelists several questions, but we will of course leave time at the end of the call for questions from our uh, participants tonight. So if you have a question, you can either type it in the chat box or we'll give some time for you to raise your hand um, and ask your question to our panelists in person at the end of uh, tonight's market chat if you'd like to. And we'll get to as many of those as we can. I also just wanna mention that we will be recording tonight's market chat and that's so that we can post it and share it with folks in the future. Um, so just if you're not comfortable being on camera, definitely keep your camera off. And then I want to turn it over to our CEO, Cheryl Cronin, who is going to give a brief introduction of tonight's panelists. Harry, thanks so much. It's great to have all of you. And on behalf of the Boston Public Market, I really want to welcome everyone to this uh, event. We really enjoy doing these market chats every week, every month, I'm sorry, led by Carrie DeWitt, our amazing Director of Community Engagement. Um, we are really happy to have some very special panelists tonight, which essentially is um, uh, four of our very favorite vendors to the Boston Public Market. And in alphabetical order, since we don't play favorites because they're all amazing and special, uh, Mark Parrish of Crescent Ridge, Brian Quinn of Nuts, of Boston Honey Company and Alan Nancy Rose of Red Apple Farm. And uh, we can't wait to hear from you all. And with that, I'm going to um, turn it back to Carrie. Thank you so much, Cheryl. And so I know Cheryl just gave a brief introduction to everyone, but I'd love to give you all some time to uh, introduce yourself to everybody who's here attending the call tonight. So maybe um, I'm gonna give everybody a, a minute, a minute and a half to introduce themselves tonight. And Evan, I'm going to start with you. Oh, really? The youngest starts first? That's great. Yeah, so if you can tell us a little bit about who you are, your business, and the history of it, that'd be great. Great. Okay, so once again, my name is Evan Rosesco with Boston Honey Company. Um, I'm the second, I guess, generation. Uh, my father started the business back in 1996. Um, my role kind of begins when I was seven years old. I began working as like a little assistant in the field. So where most kids grow up, their chores are stuff around the house. Mine was helping my father keep bees. Um, and then around the age of 14, 15, I started being a little more full time. So anytime I wasn't at school, I was working with bees or working on the warehouses and doing facility work. Uh, when the summer hit, it was full time beekeeping up until six or seven o'clock. And then I would go run cross country and then work yeah. on stuff for the next day. So, uh, Basically, my whole life has been growing up, has been also growing up with the business. That's great. Thanks so much, Evan. And Q, how about you? Um, hi, I'm Brian Quinn. Um, uh, everybody knows me as Q from Q's Nuts. My wife and I started this business about 20 years ago, just a part-time thing, filling weekends, teach my kids how to, how to work for a living at young ages. Um, they're both tremendous workers, so it worked. We have a line of sweet and savory nuts. I have over 20 flavors in production. We do peanuts, almonds, cashews, pecans, and I have over 100 recipes and recipe books I've been writing for the past 20 years. You can roast it, I can do it. <laughs> and I think to round out our cheese board, I'm seeing right here that we're making a cheese board. How about we'll go to our dairy vendor, Crescent Ridge. Mark, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, Carrie, thanks. I'm uh, Mark Parrish from Crescent Ridge. Uh, we're a 90-year-old uh, family-owned farm and uh, dairy brand, which was started by my grandfather in 1932. Uh, it got its start really delivering fresh glass bottled milk to homes around Boston. And today we, we continue that tradition, that delivery tradition, making about 6,000 deliveries per week. And uh, we also continue to build our yeah, reputation well, for award-winning ice cream. Yeah. We think through our actions and in partnerships, we were encouraging the, the preservation of you know, small New England uh, farms and farmers, uh, partnering with local food brands, uh, and we're committed to offering the best uh, products for a strong 
regional agricultural and food identity. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm the third generation in my family to own and operate the business. Our, the fourth generation is, is now working here as well and has been for a while. And um, we're also pasture raising our own beef and pork production mm. on the farm and uh, things are going quite well. Thanks so much, Mark. I appreciate that. And I just want to ask, um, I know Malia is trying really hard to mute everyone if anyone unmuted, but if whoever is not muted right now could mute their phone, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. And with that, I'm going to go to Alan Nancy of Red Apple Farm. Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Al, and this is my wife, Nancy, and we run Red Apple Farm. Uh, we're blessed to be part of a fourth generation farm that started back in 1912. And, uh, it uh, was predominantly a, a wholesale apple operation for quite a while and right up through the 80s. And then my dad knew we wouldn't stay in business if we stayed in wholesale and really changed the trajectory to be a retail uh, farm. And that really got into to pick your own apples. So uh, pick your own apples is a big thing in the fall. And when I came over, that was our real focus was the fall. And uh, our goal is to be, to be sustainable, relevant, and, uh, and to really meet year round. So to do that, we really diversified our business, um, both in the crops we do. We have about 50 varieties of apples. We have a lot of summer crops, such as blueberries and raspberries and peaches. And last year, or two, I'm sorry, like two or, two or three years ago now, we, we uh, started uh, sunflowers. So we really have uh, changed the seasons. Uh, we have pears and pumpkins and things like that in the fall and potatoes. Uh, but we've also diversified the products that we make. We've been making fresh cider here for a long time, and we've uh, a few years ago started making hard cider. Um, of course, the cider has to go into our cider donuts, which is one of the things we're famous for, and a host of other things from fudge to peanut butter. And last but not least, we really adapted and diversified uh, being year-round in the locations that we are. So in the winter, we're proud to be part of our Chusa Mountain ski area, where people uh, come into both the lodge that we operate at the halfway up and at the base lodge where we sell all our our cider donuts, hot cider, and all our, our farm fare. And then we're very proud to be part of the Boston Public Market since the genesis in 2015. And that was a big yeah, shot being year round. So, thank you. Thanks, Al. We really appreciate that. And I want to talk a little bit more about all of your businesses, but really, um, who in your family is it that's really involved in the day-to-day -day operations of your business, whether that's at the Boston Public Market or back at your farms or your production facilities, or at your other retail locations or your wholesale operations. And Q, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, it's basically me, my wife, and my, my, my wife Beth and my son Aiden. Um, I take care of most of the cooking. My wife takes care of most of uh, the bill paying and my son is all my tech. So we're kind of pretty well rounded with that. And That's then I, don't, I, I don't wanna leave out peaches, my steps on over at the Boston Public Market. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we know that a lot of people who aren't really members of your family have turned into members of your family. That's too. right. And how about you, Mark? Who in your family is involved to the, in the day-to-day -day running of Crescent Ridge? Well, my, uh, my wife is here full-time, uh, thankfully, and has been for a number of years. Um, our 25-year-old son uh, joined us full-time um, about six months ago. Um, so there's three of us full-time. Um, we have a couple of younger boys, uh, teenagers that uh, work uh, part-time, if you will. And uh, our, our eldest daughter worked here for a lot of years, um, you know, during her, during her college years. Um, we have 40 full-time employees and about 80 part-time. So we're, we're, we're pretty well structured now. Um, and so there's, you know, there's a real kind of division of um, roles and responsibilities. Um, Although in a farm and it's still a small business, you know, we all end up wearing many hats. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the structure that we have is, uh, is, is helpful, I think, to, to, to run the business. That's great. Thanks, Mark. And Alan, Nancy, who in your family, obviously, besides the two of you, are involved in the day-to-day -day operations of your farm? Um, we do have three kids that still help out part-time. Um, one's mm -hmm. still in high school, but the other two are kind of, you know, off and on when they can. Um, actually, we all planted apple trees just, uh, two days ago. We planted a row of apple trees together, which was fun. 
That's so cool, though. Um, and my father-in-law, Al's dad, who's 87, he winters in Florida, but he's here every day and always doing something. He's involved completely day to day um, when he's in Massachusetts. So he's full, full of suggestions and advice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's great to hear. Right. And how about you, Evan? Who in your family is involved in the day to day operations of Boston Honey Company? So obviously myself, but also uh, my mom and my dad. Uh, for my kind of roles, I am the most public uh, facing person, meaning I do all the, I, I'll part I used to manage full time the store in Boston, but now I'm handing off roll off to one of my employees who has been with me for five years there since mm -hmm. we've opened. And then um, I also manage our new farm stand that we just opened here in Halston while also doing a little bit of everything. So I'll either be delivery driver where I need to be, or I'm handling, I'm working in the fields. Like I was supposed to tonight move bees, but tomorrow night I'll be doing pollination. Um, so I, just like any small family business, we all handle a bunch of hats. My mom does all of our, she handles the core of the business. So without my mom, the business doesn't run. All the bill pays, all the invoices, she tracks every single penny. Um, and my dad has never uh, looked at a checkbook because she handles all that. <laughs> um, and then my dad does all the B work. He also handles a lot of infrastructure work in terms of making sure all the machines are running properly. Um, and our crews that we have several crews. We have a crew here in Massachusetts, a crew in Georgia, and a crew in upstate New York. And he coordinates with everybody and goes between all three states to make sure everyone's we're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And I know um, that Mark specifically mentioned this, but could everybody kind of just give everyone a sense of how many people work for you, both part and full time? And Evan, we'll, we'll continue on with you if you could give us a sense of that number. So at full strength, we number anywhere between up to maybe 15 to 20 people with including part timers. So we'll have about a core group of seven full timers and a few part timers here and there. Um, at full strength, we can go up to 20. But right now we're pretty low at or below 10. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Evan. How about you, Q? How many people total work for you? Uh, Pre-COVID, it was eight, plus me and my wife. Now we're down to three, and me and my wife. Wow. It's taking on a lot of extra responsibility, I'm sure. Yeah. And how about you, Al and Nancy? We have eight managers. Yeah, we have about eight, but we also have field work. So I'd say we're anywhere 10 to 12 people here at the farm and probably four at, at the market. Um, our manager being the full-time and then there's four part-time workers. Um, but in season, when we're in apple season, we have probably a, a hundred part-timers here or more. It could be wow. more. Yeah. Yeah. That's I used to be there also I knew, but now, <laughs> now I don't look at it. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So, so obviously, you know, we're here to talk tonight to talk about family businesses and how your family runs their business, but obviously included in those numbers are a lot of people that are not part of your family. And so obviously part of running a family business is oftentimes bringing people into the fold who aren't family members. Does anybody maybe want to talk a little bit about what it's like to have people who aren't part of your family work for your family business? And Alan, Nancy, maybe we'll start with you because I know you have a lot of people who work for you that are not family members. Yeah, we actually call it a family because, um, you know, when we first started back, Al and I did everything from, you know, stocking the store and baking and he did everything in the field and we had kids in play pens behind the cash, cash register um, and slowly grew into having staff and they've just been become part of the family and at one point we didn't have offices so they worked in our house alongside us they worked at the kitchen table they worked you know we shared desks and all of that. So um, we do have close relationships. They are some of our, our closest friends that we work with. So it's a very nice environment, but um, yeah. And then there's just that whole seasonal um, part-time thing, but it's just, it's a good community. It's, um, it's a, it's more than family, you know, sometimes you get to pick your family, but you get to pick your friends. So, right. So this is, um, it's a nice thing that we have. It, it feels, it feels like a really good community. That's great. And how about you, Q? I mean, you already alluded to the fact that your manager at the BPM is like a family member. Well, at, at Q's, you got two choices. I either adopt you or I fire you. <laughs> <laughs> and Mark, how about you? How about the people that aren't in your family? How does that work for you? Oh, it works. It works great. Um, I mean, we're, we're so fortunate now with, with, the team we have, the, the employees, it's, it's uh, really amazing. You know, the last uh, 
number of years as um, our, as our great older employees um, retired. And, and now we just have a, I think a really motivated, great group of younger um, people. Um, you know, we're a very diverse um, company today, which is, which is wonderful. And um, I, I just see a lot of energy and positivity, you know, um, um, among the employees. Um, and, uh, you know, everyone really seemed to engage well with one another. And uh, so uh, again, as I said, I, I feel, feel pretty fortunate about that. Um, and, um, you know, I, I feel that myself and, and my family members, you know, I think we're, we're, all, we're all part of it. And, you know, so um, I think that kind of helps with the culture. <laughs> That's great. Thanks. I really appreciate that. And I guess to dive right into some, you know, more personal topics, I'm wondering if everyone can share how they navigate working with their partner every day. Um, you know, what's the, what's the division of labor like? How has that gone for you? Um, Q, I, I'm going to start with you on that one. What's it like to work with your partner every day? Um, it, it, it varies. We, we, it's really difficult to shut it off. Um, we try. Um, if we're building the business and doing exciting things, it's great because we're kind of all here. Um, and it, it's, it's just fun to talk about. The days that you have your struggles and you got to look at each other all day long, it gets a little more difficult. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I like to say the best info I can give anybody is keep your sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all know that you have a good one. I think that's really good advice. Mark, how about you? I know that you and Ann work really closely together to run Crescent Ridge. What's that like? Uh, <clears throat> I think it's great. Um, you know, we have very kind of specific roles, but we... We, we definitely mesh and have to work together during the day. Um, quite honestly, she just helps me not make mistakes. Um, she's very uh, organized and diligent and makes me look a lot better than I am on my own. Um, and, uh, you know, she, she needs to interact with, uh, with others in the company quite a bit. So she's very involved in that. And, um, you know, she likes to keep her space for me when she needs to. Uh, and, I hope she's uh, here listening to that right now. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so it's been uh, it's been really good from my perspective, and I think hers as well. That's great. And Alan, Nancy, how about you? Um, well, I'll just say a couple of quick things. One is I think it's funny with COVID how many people have complained that they have to work with their spouses and uh, they hear their <laughs> voices and and, and uh, I actually had a manager complain she's working at home. I'm like, well, I do that every day. So it, it is, uh, um, you know, we're something that we're, we're really blessed to be able to work together. And uh, I, I look and I'm uh, my, my skill is to get things done kind of guy. And, and she's uh, her skill is to make sure it's done right. So you kind of have to have the two really. So we're very, uh, very, very blessed that way. And we do, uh, with the manager system we have in place, um, we, 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 we meet weekly to discuss things. And it's just kind of nice that we have a very collaborative um, spirit at the farm to make things happen. And I think it's it's part of our culture who we are. Yeah, I would say, you know, I yeah. Think we're very like-minded and we definitely um, work, we work well together. And, you know, he's got his duties, he's outside a lot and I've got office work to do, so you're not, like sharing space all the time. Like some people in COVID had to sit in the like same apartment and listen to each other. But no, uh, I think we work really great together. I don't think it's ever been an issue. We make great business partners and we complement each other very well. That's great to hear. And I think you're right. You know, when you have acres and acres to spread out on, it's probably good that you can go get some space if you need to. Evan, I'm going to ask you this question in a slightly different way, since obviously you work in a business with your parents. Um, what has it been like to be, uh, you know, the child of parents who work together every day? Uh, it has its ups and downs. So basically you have three bosses, right? My parents are bosses in their own right. They're also the ones who raised me. So they're my bosses technically, but um, they also raised me to be their equal uh, when it comes to matters of business. But sometimes it's hard to separate that. So uh, sometimes the best way to make a decision is the loudest voice in the room. Uh, but that's, it's all out of, uh, it's very constructive. So where, uh, we're very collaborative, but at the same time, I always try to 
disagree with everything. Um, just so we don't know, because we don't want to follow the group think ever. Uh, I make a, I'd rather make a good decision with a big argument versus a bad decision altogether. So they kind of agree. So they, although they appreciate me always saying, what if they also <laughs> say, shut up. Um, but it's, it, we're all, it's two big personalities. So my mom is, a, they both have extremely big personalities. Um, I'm a little more low key, uh, but it, it's um, they really have a dominant mindset as what's re- they've really propelled the business from a very small thing in our backyard to spanning three states as well as with cross country pollination. So it, it they've really pushed it a long, long way. And so although I'm kind of following the tail end of that, I'm kind of making sure all, even though they've paved a road, I'm the one that's coming along making sure all the bricks are in place. Mm-hmm. That's that's kind of what I do. That's great, Evan, and I can tell you're really proud of your parents, which is really, really nice to see. And terrified. <laughs> <laughs> um, what has been the most difficult part of running a family business? Um, obviously, we've just come through a very difficult year, and we know that you know it was a difficult year personally for people as well as professionally. When you're running a family business, those two things are so intertwined anyway. What, what have been some of the most diff- difficult parts of running a family business? And it doesn't have to be specific to the last year, but if it is, we, we would understand that too. Um, Mark, I'd, I'd love to start with you on this question. Well, um, I've been here at Crescent Ridge for 25 years now as an adult. Um, grew up in the business, of course, and I've always loved it. And, uh, you know, so we've had a variety of different family members, you know, the ones that I talked about today, my immediate family, but it was much larger in, in the past. And it was a very, a very rich and, and um, positive tradition. And I was really proud and pleased to be able to work with my dad and my uncle and, you know, the cousins and, and everyone. Um, and that's the good side of it. I think that the challenging side is really kind of maintaining productive dialogue when you're handling challenging topics, right? I mean, there are many challenging topics in business and maybe even more challenging topics in family businesses when they're multi-generational, um, you know, when, when they're, you know, legacy type businesses, um, it gets, it gets a little more com- complex and, um, you know, just trying to keep, um, you know, keep, as I said, you know, the conversations productive and I, you know, we're here 90 years. So, um, you know, I think we've, we've been able, able to do that. Um, but, uh, you know, that can be challenging, um, for sure. Yeah, for sure. How about you Q? What, what have you felt the most difficult parts of running a family business have been? Um, I don't know. I, I, I enjoy it. You know, it's been difficult with COVID because um, just um, I've eliminated my staff. So it's, it's up to me, my wife and my son to pick up all that slack of all the other employees. So we're, we're working tremendous hours. It's nice to start hiring people back, but, you know, 12 hour days, six, seven days a week, because you can't say no. We do a lot of wholesale now. And that's got to go out to, you know, 24 to 48 hours or nobody wants your stuff. Amazon has made it difficult to be able to ship casually, you know. Um, so just keeping up with the demand or keeping everybody safe. And personally, it's one of the hardest things for me is when I hire an employee that doesn't work out, letting them go. It's never easy. I've been unemployed. And those are the, the drawbacks, I guess. Yeah. That's certainly tough about running any business, I'm sure. Alan, Nancy, how about you? What have been some of the most difficult parts of running a family business? Sure. Um, I would say me personally, being a mom of four, trying to raise four kids while you're running a, a business and a farm. And our business is like five businesses in one. And you're trying to do everything to the best of your ability and um you know, there's no downtime whatsoever. Yes, we can stop to go see something at, at school, like a production or something, and um, you have that flexibility, but it's really hard because our business is also weekend-based for a lot of the year, and 
you don't have that. You're, you're, you're spending time with your kids by working. It's like, okay, great kids. You're, you're off from school. You get to go work with us now. So our, our time together is very limited. We have to be strategic about trying to carve days out um, to have time off in a way. And that's probably been the biggest challenge. And now they're all grown and, um, you know, they get to be teenagers and they don't want to spend time with you anymore, which is sad, but <laughs> there, there's still three of them around that like to do stuff with us. But yeah, I think it's balancing that um, family time and, you know, helping them with homework when you, you're trying to cook supper and pay bills and answer emails and like, you know, wrap up things for the end of the day and solve problems for employees and all of that stuff. It's like how to, how to put your family first. That's probably like put your kids first, maybe um, that family time. That's the challenge. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for that perspective, Nancy. That's super helpful. I would just, just reinforce that. It's uh, the, the exact same thing in, on a, you're always on when you're in a family business. And I think any, any of the panel members know that you're, there's never a switch that you're fully shut off. So when you own a business, you're, you're, it, it owns you. So I think yeah. to, how can you separate both from the family time and the personal time to, to step away? And our house is in the middle of the business. So that's uh that's a it's a great thing but also a, a, a curse to say the yeah, least people so. knock on the door on christmas you're having christmas and they're knocking on the door so we're, like, ah. we're, we're creative and, and finding ways to to be off from the farm and away from the farm and uh i think everyone needs to do that more often yeah and that it's a perfect segue because one of my questions was going to be you know how have you managed growing families and growing businesses and how does your family turn off business sometimes, or do you never turn off business? Um, and Evan, I'm going to start with you on this question. It's, are there times when your family can turn off business? Are you always talking about business? How do you manage that? What is family time? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> question. Um, uh, so we don't turn off uh, business time at all. Uh, basically we are Boston honey company 24 seven. Um, but it, it's, it, it is family time in a way. So when my dad and I can work together, that is family time, especially working bees together. We talk about everything about my own family planning, about our, my own succession plan after me and stuff mm -hmm. like that, as well as just the general family stuff. And, um, when my mom and I work together, when, uh, for instance, we used to do deliveries together nonstop, uh, Back when we didn't have a full-time delivery driver and throughout the pandemic, we would work together very closely. And that's kind of our own bonding time and family time because the dinner table is our nightly meeting. And that's when we talk about business, but we'll also talk about anything else going on. So everything is tied kind of together, but it never feels overwhelming. My fiance is like, you guys talk business way too much. And I'm like, it's part of the family though. Like this is like, Whereas some people ask, oh, how was your day? Well, I already know how their day went because I was with them the whole day. I know if they had a bad day or not. It's more about like, hey, how can we do this other thing better? And it's, it's for me, even though I've done it my entire life, I've never felt overwhelmed to the point where I'm like, oh, I'm so sick of tired of talking about bees. Um, it's, it's kind of just natural uh, for us to do that. There's times where we can turn off, but it takes a long time to turn off. Um, we found the appropriate vacation time is two weeks. And although it's hard for everyone else, it's because the first three or four nights, you don't relax because all you can do is think about the business and what, what's going on when you're not there. Um, so basically, it's we alternate every couple of years. Um, so I don't take vacation every year. It's every two or three years. I'll go on like a one week or two week vacation. Same thing with my parents where it takes them because they'll call me like every two hours for like three, four days straight. And then I'll, I, if I don't respond or answer it, my phone blows up. So I just answer every hour or two and be like, Hey, everything's fine. Don't worry about it. I've already on these orders. Oh, you got a notification about that. I already took care of it. Don't worry about it. I just re constantly reassure them. And then they stop, stop calling. And that's why I know they can relax and then they come back and then it's go time. Like you just need to take them on vacation with you, Evan. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Mark, how about, Mark, I want to ask you the same question. How, how, is, how does the Crescent Ridge family handle uh, managing family and, and managing work? And are you guys ever able to turn off? Well, I think my experience growing up was much like what Evan is talking about now. So as a, as a, as a kid growing up, I mean, 
that's all we ever talked about. My dad at the table, you know, my mother finally would say, can we please not talk about the business anymore? But we did anyway. And so that, that was kind of the tradition growing up. And I, I think there's, I think there was less of that. I think there was less of that in, in my house when my kids were growing up. I mean, they're, they're a bit older now. Um, there wasn't a ton of that. Um, you know, I would say now, you know, Ann and I, my wife, um, so we, we talk about the business quite a lot, you know, when we're not at the business. Um, but we're, so like if we're out to dinner or we're, we're, we're home, we'll, we'll try to like dispense with the, with the business talk, you know, uh, as quickly as we can to maybe try to, you know, engage in some, in some other ways. So I, I would say there's probably a little bit less of that now than, uh, than in the past, but it's, it's, it's still pretty prevalent. And, uh, my, my parents are, uh, are alive uh, and, uh, you know, kind of struggling with, with, with their, their age. And um, so I, I see them, you know, four or five days a week. And uh, even, even my father in his advanced age is, you know, uh, it's all he wants to talk about. And um, apparently he's been, been waking up in the middle of the night lately um, saying, oh, I have, I have to get down to Crescent Ridge. I, you know, they, they need me. You know, uh, you know, Mark's there, and so I don't know whether he means Mark's there. They, you know, I better get the heck down there, <laughs> <laughs> or, or what, or what he's saying. But uh, uh, so that's kind of how it is. Yeah. And and Q, how about you? How do you guys handle family time and business time? Oh yeah, we get home. My wife goes to her art studio. My son goes plays video games, and I get on my motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> Good to have creative outlets. <laughs> we all have our own thing and we try and keep it separate you know I, you know I know i had shared with everybody earlier that you know the panelists earlier that i also grew up in a family yeah. business and i i have similar experiences to all of you where the dinner the dinner table was always the time where we talked about the business so i completely I think I'll, I'll put it best we don't own the business the business owns us and anybody that doesn't believe that is only kidding themselves <laughs> <laughs> Is true. So I, I know that we talked a little bit about, you know, your biggest challenges as family business owners. What are some of the biggest accomplishments your family business has had and some of the things that you are most proud of? And Q, I'm going to keep going with you if you want to talk about things you're most proud of with Q's. Uh, I'm, I'm super proud. We started this business doing outdoor events. My first push card had $700 to start this business. I built a nut cooking cart because I couldn't afford to buy one. Um, and we took it from there. I now have the Boston Public Market, my Somerville store. I wholesale throughout the country. I cook for some of the better restaurants in Boston for just toppings. Um, I, I do a uh, commission work. I just picked up a big contract with Theory Wellness. It's one of the weed people that make candy bars. I'm not doing the weed end of it, but I'm doing topping for the candy bar. We've been doing this so long that there's a lot of people around, especially in New England, when they want something roasted like what I do, you know what I mean? They call me, they, they know that I can do it. Um, the, the latest one was they wanted me to do cocoa nibs. I never roasted a cocoa nib in my life. I did it because I wanted to find out if I could. And now it's just another. I'm also very proud of my son, the way he stepped up and really takes control. And I get a big kick out of watching him boss people around. <laughs> <laughs> that's great i can tell you're really proud of aiden that's wonderful that's how about it. you nancy and al what are your some of, some of your biggest accomplishments at red apple farm or some of the things you're most proud of it's kind of i don't i think the fact that we're still here and we're, we're we work hard to be uh sustainable viable and relevant and that those are such moving targets from year to year and you know you, know, you always get curveballs when you're a farmer with weather you know we've had a big hail storm and Everyone had a big hailstorm last year called COVID, right? So there's all these things you got to adapt and and and, uh, and work against. And I think uh, I think we've done a great job, not just our family, but as a team to to change and, and be. And that last part, the relevant, um, we started getting into hard cider, then now the brew barn. And ten years ago, if somebody said we would be serving alcohol on the farm. I would have said no, you know. So you got to just kind of constantly change. So I think to me, it's I think Mark called it a legacy business. I think if you can keep the business going for the legacy for hopefully the next generation. That's that, that would be the ultimate accomplishment or 
that they got to be the most proud of, I guess. Yeah, and I, I think, too, um, a lot of the lives that we've affected, you know, we hire a lot of teenagers, mm -hmm. and we talked about, you know, we had that question about the, the family and working outside of the family or employees. Well, some of these kids that have been working for us since, like, our first year here, they're our, some of our closest family friends, and we're watching them get married and have children, and, um, you know, who knows, in another... 10 years, some of their kids may be working here and they're just so proud to have been a part of our farm and they love the connection. They, you know, still wear Red Apple Farm sweatshirts and hats and everything everywhere they go. And um, that, I'm really proud of that. I'm proud that they like that connection to our farm and they're proud to be part of our farm. That's great. They're proud to be part of your family too, I can tell. Mark, how about you? What are some of your biggest accomplishments at Crescent Ridge? Well, I don't know that they're, that they're mine necessarily, but, um, I kind of echo what Al and, and Nancy said, you know, just the fact of you know, the longevity of the business and where we're still here, you know, we'll be, we haven't been around as long as Red Apple Farm, but it'll be 90 years for us next year. And just 90 years. <laughs> and that's, uh, so that's quite an accomplishment, um, you know, with all the business cycles, um, you know, that have occurred, you know, during those years. So I, you know, I, I think, that in and of itself is is a is a great accomplishment. Um, yeah, you know, I'm proud of the the team we've kind of assembled in the last you know four or five years. Um, you know, we needed to turn around a few things um, at that point in time, um, and uh, you know they came up with with a plan, and um, it's uh, it's working, and so. Um, you know, I'm, I'm proud of the team and, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the way that we've, we've kind of assembled it. Um, and I guess, you know, one last thing is, you know, like all of our businesses, you have to change and diversify and pivot and all these, all these things. And uh, we, we've done quite a lot of that in the last 10 to 15 years. And uh, I think it's, you know, now it's starting to bear fruit and, uh, it's uh, pretty exciting, so I'm I'm pretty pretty bullish on the on the future, and uh, we'll just say our prayers. <laughs> and Evan, last but not least, how about you? What are some of the biggest accomplishments at Boston Honey Company, or things that you're most proud of? So I'll start with overall as a company. Uh, I'm, you know, our biggest accomplishment, of course, is getting to as as big as we've gone so far, and how far we've come um, from just a little uh, backyard hobby business to the full-time operation are now, but also the biggest one is just most recently, uh, you know, we just spent two years and some change in construction, building our new flagship area, our new farm stand, our new production facility. Um, and we opened this past November, smack dab in the middle of a pretty crazy time. And being able to run that as well as we have with, you know, keeping our employees safe, um, keeping my mom and dad safe um, and everyone relatively healthy and also dealing with all the influx of business we've gone from that has been a huge accomplishment um, but also it saved our business because if we hadn't moved we never would have had the space so we we're operating out of a collection of warehouses that were way too small for us and the way things have changed now is when you when you need supplies you need to order like whole tractor trailer loads versus just one pallet. So luckily because of all the space we have, it's we've been able to grow our business, but also like save our business at the same time um, and avoid a lot of restrictions that were soon to come down on us that we very narrowly avoided. Um, but I'm very eager to see what happens next because even though we've gone to this point, um, we're enjoying it right now. It's just, we're gonna expand a lot more right after. And that's what I'm very excited for as well. That's great, I'm glad to hear it, Evan. Um, we've talked a lot about, um, obviously, Evan, you are a child in a family business, and we've talked a lot about the ways that your children have been involved in the business or still are involved in the business. Can you maybe share some tips with um, the people that are on this call tonight for uh, succession planning? How do you pair, prepare for the next generation to take over? And Hugh, I, I'd love to start with you for that question. How do you, how do you start to prepare that? Um, I, I never wanted to prep for it that way. I started this business because it's something I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I was never going to force that upon my children. My daughter doesn't work for me, but she does do social media stuff for me. And that's great. I want her to follow her love. 
My son didn't start out wanting to do this, but he's really connected to the business. I mean, this kid was eight years old, set up um, cooking cards with me up in Newburyport where we started. Um, and he's just falling in love with the business. It would break his heart if I sold it. You know, I keep saying I'm waiting for my $20 million and then I'm out of here, you know, but I don't know if he let me sell it anymore. So it's, um, I'm proud to see him take it over, but it's nothing that I would have said, you got to do this. I mean, I'm fortunate in a way that I'm not like Mark and Alan Nancy because I don't have a legacy here. I built something out of nothing. I've accomplished what I wanted to do, you know, so... <laughs> Yeah, I think it's great advice, you know, maybe not put the pressure on it and, and hope that the, uh, they naturally fall in love with what it is that you do. And I'm glad that Aiden has. Alan, Nancy, how about you? What, what's your uh, advice for succession planning or planning for the next generation? Well, I, a couple, I, I, two items to respond to. One is I, I agree uh, with Q wholeheartedly that um, you, you got to have a passion to keep the, keep, to be in the family business and, and to be a farmer and to live on a farm and all the things that come with that. And uh, I think it's it's critical that you have to con convince yourself you have that passion. And when you're young, you know, that's, you don't really know everything. At least most people don't. <laughs> and uh, and it's very important. I think it's great that my dad left the farm and he did his own thing for a long time. And then he came back and I was able to afford an opportunity to do the same thing and able to came, come back. And, you know, they say the grass is greener on the other side and, and you really need to leave the farm um, the, the family business and in my opinion to really know you want to be part of it so we're we're co convincing our kids to do the same thing follow their as, as q said their passion and then and hopefully one two three or four of them will be crazy enough to come back and we'll, we'll see what happens um and then when you get to the point of actually transitioning um i was really blessed to have a father not only was he ready to transition the business um, and it wasn't easy. We had a lot of complications. I had a stepmother and a lot of other things we had to get through. Um, but what advice I'd give is uh, we, we work with a third party. So uh, uh, someone that really helped us to make it so that it was possible. So my advice is you're looking at transition this. Don't do it alone. There's a lot of communication and communication does not happen between a father and a son. I think we can all agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> moderator is, um, is a really great uh, tool and they have experience and they've seen other transitions and they have you know advice of things that might work out this way or try this or whatever so they just very helpful so I guess if we were going to transition over to any of our children or all of them um, I, I would like to think that we would have outside help to make that happen to work out for everybody. That's great. Yeah, that's good advice. Some outside help is good. Mark, how about you? Any uh, advice for transition planning? Hmm. Um, I would again kind of go back to what Alan and Nancy had to say, you know, how, how important it, it is to maybe have an out, you know, have some outside advisor, some outside because the, the conversations can be can be challenging depending on you know, the size, the complexity, all of that. And, um, you know, not everyone's opinions are going to align. You know, there's going to be some disagreement, which isn't necessarily bad because through conversation and a 360 look at things, you come up with a, a good solution sometimes. But having, you know, independent, qualified outside people, they, they, can, be the, they can be the lightning rod for the, the really difficult conversations, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, family member one or two pieces it, and then it becomes emotional. Um, Cause it's, you know, it's inherently emotional of the, the family business, uh, you know, say what you want, you know, say that, oh yeah, we're, it's, you know, we're just gonna make business decisions. Well, sure you are, but they're, you know, they're wrapped around this, this emotional piece. And so, you know, ha having having some good outside counsel advisors, et cetera, you know, really, you know, really is a good way to go. Um, so that that's helpful. Um, you know, we're not really at, at Crescent Ridge. We're just kind of getting our feet wet, if you will, with um, with the fourth generation. Um, I I I appreciated growing up how my own father never put you know, pressure on me to 
join the business. You know, I, I think, I think he, I think he was hopeful that I would, but um, you know, and, and eventually I did not right away, but um, that was, it was very positive feeling for me then. And it continues to be now. And um, you know, I, I hope, you know, the same thing for my own kids, you know, that, um, you know, they're, they're going to have to, they're going to need a passion for it. They're going to really have to come to love it if they want to do it. And if, and if they don't, uh, they should follow their own passions and, and loves in life, you know, um, and, and be happy, whatever, whatever that is. So I'm, I'm trying to, trying to channel my, my father in that, um, in that way. That's yeah. great. I think that's really good advice. And um, I want to give everybody that's on the call tonight a chance to ask you guys some questions. So if anybody wants to put a, a question into the chat box um, so we could read those or if you want to raise your hand, that'd be great. And while we're kind of doing that, I'm going to ask you all a, a final question. And that is, uh, what's next for your business? What's coming up in the future? And, and Evan, I'm going to start with you because you already alluded to, um, you know, the, the growth. And so if you could just maybe in one or two sentences, everybody kind of tell us what's next, and then we'll get to some questions from the audience. So what's next for us is really kind of based at our farm stand here in Holliston. Um, we've been doing honey for years, candles for years, um, all those types of things. But now we are looking to add a lot more than just that. So we're looking at having um, a little... I guess a little farm stand brewery. Not we're always be brewing a house, but we're bringing other local breweries in and serving them outside. Um, I really would like to get into uh, other food types of foods, uh, like a breakfast special, um, and kind of start getting my dad back into culinary, which is his one of his original passions. On top of that, we'll be opening up a. Uh, it's kind of like a B pen for educational classes, and I'll be leading that where I'll be in a, the center of a kind of like a U form. This U is gonna be a double netted tent so people can walk in, we close the nets, the bees won't come into them. Be nice like breathable mesh and I can work bees and show them up close without having to get everyone into a bee suit. So I'll be expanding kind of like some more educational aspects but also looking at more concessions that we can add to the farm stand and kind of developing our property to be a, a full family farm too. Cause now, uh, Mark, you're gonna love this. I got more cows coming along. So I'm gonna have to start catching up. <laughs> we know somebody you can talk to when you need help with that, Evan. And yeah. Mark, how about you? What's, what's next for Crescent Ridge? Right here, please, please. <laughs> yeah, another one of my dad's projects. Evan, cows, Mark. What's next for Crescent Ridge? <laughs> well, um, who has a crystal ball? But um, I, I think, you know, the, the demand for our, our, our products and our services is, is really strong. Um, and so I think the future is pretty bright, you know, so home delivery continues to be, you know, a real, a real growth uh, piece. Um, we still have a waiting list, even though we've bought some trucks and hired. Um, so the demand for that is, is good. Um, you know, our, our ice cream, you know, has received many, many awards and we, we feel that, you know, uh, as a local brand, we're kind of well positioned to, um, to expand there. And so we're working, working on some initiatives there. Um, we have done and are doing um, a fair amount of work in our milk plant. Um, we're, we're, we're making upgrades so that we'll be able to have more of our own branded products, which we think is um, you know, better, better for the company. Um, so I guess in a nutshell, um, in a nutshell, that, that's it. Um, you know, we're, we're careful about, you know, retail locations. Um, you know, so we have a kind of a locally popular, you know, we call it a dairy bar, ice cream stand on the farm in Shannon. And it's been there 50 years. Um, and we had an, a, another, we had a second retail location locally here that we had for a few years. And, um, we, we got out of that at the end of the lease. We kind of broke even on it, so we didn't get hurt. Um, and we've loved being at the Boston Public Market. That was that was a great um, a great um, choice for us. And so, if we were to expand, say, a retail retail ice cream, I'm not really looking for storefronts or places like that, but more like destination locations. And you know, I think the Boston Public Market is a is a great destination 
location. Um, in fact, wasn't it just voted one of the top 10 um, public Excellent markets? Excellent plug market. Absolutely was voted one of the top 10 markets in the hey. country. You're absolutely right. We thank you for that marketing. Alan, Nancy, how about you? What's up? What's next for Red Apple Farm? Um, real quick, I think uh, we're, we were planting zinnias this year, so that's exciting. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> uh, but the biggest change for us is uh, we've been working on it since last year is we're we uh, put in a geothermal well that's going to be tied into a solar thermal um, system where all that so that we can actually have heat in our buildings year round. So our brew barn will be heated and be open uh, year round. So that's kind of a, a big step. That's great. That's, we can't wait to come see it. And how about you, Q? What's next for Q's? Uh, actually, we're expanding into wholesale. Um, we just picked up a, a new equipment for packaging. I'm looking for a larger cooking facility and packing facility, hopefully within the next 12 months. I've added a sales force out in Atlanta. We'll be showing at the Atlanta Gift Mart. I won't be there, but this company will be. And then we picked up another sales rep on the West Coast. It's going to cover New Mexico, Arizona, California, Texas. And he's got a showroom in um, Houston. So between those two, I'm going to be wishing I hadn't done any of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. We're excited to see you expand. And I just want to remind everyone, if anyone wants to ask a question, please feel free to raise your hand and I'll call on you. Um, but for now, I'm going to read something that's in the chat box. And uh, this respondent says it's a comment rather than a question. This has been really interesting and heartwarming. I registered because my family started getting deliveries from Crescent Ridge about five weeks ago in Melrose. This session today reminds and reinforces my belief in the notion that we need to support local family owned businesses. I believe this more now than even an hour ago. By the way, I am right now eating out of the carton Crescent Ridge English Toffee Crunch. Thank That's you. The only way to eat it. The only way to eat it. That is the only way to eat it. I agree, because you're going to eat the whole carton anyway. Thank you very much. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question? If you want to raise your hand, I'll call on you. That's a good question. So Jackie says, what advice would each panelist give to someone thinking of starting a food-based business through local markets and stores? And she says specifically her food business is marinades and sauces. I think um, I'll comment a little bit on this one uh, since I have a product sort of similar to marinades and sauces. I am in that jarred category. Um, the heart, so you're gonna face a number of challenges. Um, one of them is getting people to sample your products. Uh, right now with the pandemic, it is difficult to sample things out because whereas you like a honey, like a marmalade or a sauce or marinade or a sauce, we have to sample it for people to wanna buy it. Um, and we're in a market where people just don't just grab it off the shelf. So you have to make the story behind your product really catching in order for people to do that. So if you have to pretend like you're not going to sample your product out, you have to pretend like your jar, your bottle will have to tell your entire story and sell it to them for you. And you do that through really good packaging um, and try to make your story on that bottle or jar and make it succinct and really stand out. Um, but the next thing is farmers markets are going to be your number one friend where you can personally interact with your customers and doing demos and demos and demos and really honestly being your own salesperson and being big on it and, and being passionate about your product. And by being so, you're going to sell and, and grow your, your business that way. It is very challenging to be in that kind of jarred sector. Um, but as you grow and people kind of gain your traction, you'll grow with it. Alan, Nancy, I know you sell some jarred and, and bottled products as well. Do you want to answer this? And, and just as a plug, I want to tell this person, we do run some farmer market, farmer's markets and also have pop-ups in the market. So when you're ready for that, reach out to us. But Alan, Nancy, how about you? I was going to actually, one of the first things that came to mind for me was farmer's markets. I think that's a great way to um, meet face-to-face, -face, especially as a small business, um, to set up these pretty low well with them. Another way to reach out within your community and local businesses would be um, cafes, food trucks, things like that, that can use your marinades. Um, you help each other out and they'll advertise for you. And then, you know, if you can get your product into some smaller shops, smaller local gift shops, maybe not um, 
completely like mm, grocery markets, but maybe specialty um, gift shops and things like that. It's a good way just to get your name out there and get the growth started. Farm, farm stands are also a great place <laughs> for that sort of thing. Excellent. Thanks, Nancy. And I, I think we have time for one more question. Is there anybody else that has another question they'd like to ask our panelists? You can either put it in the chat box or raise your hand. I'm just flipping through the screens right now to see any hands raised. I, I have kind of a comment based on Jackie's question. Um, sure. But I'm, I'm, it, it's kind of for Q because he, he, he I mean, it isn't marinades, but he, he started, you know, he, he had a startup 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, so he had to sort of face the same sort of challenges and, and questions that the Jackie's kind of mm -hmm. saying, I hope you don't mind me usurping your. No, your, not your at all. You're I think absolutely right. hear what, what, what Q has to say. To Evan's point about branding, Q, you have wonderful packaging and branding. It's beautiful. Who? Me? You? Yeah. <laughs> See, that, that's the whole, it's the whole, it's the whole family affair, you know? My, my wife actually designed her packaging. Um, she, she, um, we got came up to New England because she was a student at uh, the School Museum of Fine Arts, and I was an 18 year old kid that couldn't live without her. So I stuck my thumb out and lived in the Boston Commons for about three months before I had his roof over my head. Um, so um, farmers markets ag agree, it's great. It's how I kind of introduced myself in the city. We were a seasonal vendor at the time, you know. So most of your gigs were between Memorial Day and Labor Day. You know, come January, December, you know, it was pretty lean in between. So we realized that, you know, either I had to find a real job. <laughs> I've had one of those before. I didn't really like it. Um, we really had to be serious about this, but I've done everything. I've knocked on doors. I spent more money on gas and I'd end up selling by the end of the day. So it's really got to be a labor of love. Um, the food business is incredibly difficult. There's for every one of me with a nut company, there's a hundred guys behind me. So how do you get that merchant to buy your stuff over the other guys? And a lot of it is sampling. Yeah. The Boston Public Market has been fantastic for us. That's actually grown my web business, which is huge. And I'd also say that um, don't get tunnel vision with retail stores. Selling food items to retail stores is probably one of the most toughest parts of the food business there is you would probably be a lot better off going into food service and selling much larger quantities. But again, try your stuff out at, at, um, at farmer's markets. And unfortunately, you, you got to do a lot of sampling. So you'll go into stores that'll buy your stuff because you sample. And once you stop sampling, they stop buying. You know, it's, it's you, you become a decoration. But these are all the things you got to do because it's really just getting out there and beating the pavement and getting people to know your product. Uh, thinking us probably, I, I'd say we've been packaging products for about 10 years now. And it's, you know, it's, it's every day is a challenge. <laughs> I think that's great advice from all of you is really get out, get your product out there, let people try it and see what they think. Um, and obviously that it's a lot of hard work, which I know you, you all gotta do. love what you do and you can't get insulted. Yep. There you go. That's good too. Thick skin. Um, I wanna say thank you so much to all of you. We know how busy you are. So to our panelists, thank you so much for your time tonight. We are so appreciative of you sharing your stories and, and your knowledge with everybody here tonight. Um, it's really wonderful to have you um, and to see all your faces. And to everyone that participated tonight, thank you so much for being part of our market chat series. And we hope you will join us in May for our next market chat. Um, and thank you again to everyone. And we are gonna end here, but if anyone wants to rewatch this, it will be posted on our YouTube channel. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Hey, everybody. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks, Boston Public Market. <laughs> Thank you.